So we will hear first from uh, Professor Henrich, <coughs> then from Professor Streeter. <coughs> After that, I will call on the people whose names I have in the following order. First, Professor, uh, <coughs> third of all, <coughs> first of, the, of this other group, Professor Woodman, University of Western Ontario, then Professor Hernardi of Rochester, then Pro Professor Hamlin of uh, Toronto, <laughs> um, Professor Brown of Boston, Professor Arak of Princeton, Professor Falconer of Toronto, um, Professor Hughes of Toronto, um, Professor Cameron of Toronto, and then the <coughs> gentlemen who have already spoken at length and who wish to reply to the discussion, I have um, Oh, sorry, Cam Professor Cameron was one of those, and then Professor Mink, um, Professor Hartman, and that's the last name on my list. And after that, the meeting will be thrown open. <laughs> <laughs> I most earnestly request those whose names you have heard, and everyone else, to speak for not more than five minutes if possible, and not more than 10 minutes, even if impossible. <laughs> and uh, we wish to terminate proceedings at 4 o'clock so that people can leave. We will, in any case, terminate proceedings at 4.30. So I will not, um, <coughs> I will not be here after 4.30. <laughs> and, um, uh, without, um, without further delay, then, it's my uh, pleasure to call on Professor Dieter Henrich, the University of Heidelberg and Columbia University to um, say what he wishes. Now from the long list of those names, it's sufficiently clear that there are no papers to be presented, and uh, my remarks, although based on notes, are entirely uh, spontaneous and improvised. I, as a matter of fact, wrote these notes after lunch. Uh, I want to give a little supplement to what was said over these days and also I would like to make a comment on uh, the meeting in general, <coughs> its structure and uh, I try to provide sort of an explanation why it had that structure. Uh, we have Romanticism and Historicism and then a second title that competes in importance with the first one use and abuse of, of, of history and criticism. There's obviously an ambiguity in that title. Uh, as far as two possibilities of reading uh, it are concerned, Romanticism and Historicism seems to associate an historical subject, two types uh, of criticism as they were developed at a particular time. Uh, Whereas the other title that competes uh, associates expectations as to a systematic analysis of possibilities of criticism, among them, possibly uh, in an exhausting way, the two types, romantic and historicist criticism. Since it seems to be obvious that historicism and romanticism don't exhaust the possibilities of criticism, there is a natural association that uh, the meeting would be on an historical issue, and some of the uh, meetings, as a matter of fact, were. But if you look at the titles of those sections, all of them are systematic. Uh, and I believe that has a reason in uh, the conditions of present uh, times criticism. I shall start with a thesis. Although Romanticism and Historicism might have been described correctly by various speakers, among them Professor White, it's certainly the case that the resources of criticism, even in that particular time to which Romanticism and Historicism as types of criticism belong, aren't exhausted. For instance, one cannot uh, describe uh, the <coughs> types of history of philosophy as they were generated in that time, sufficiently either as historicist or romanticist, for, uh, history of philosophy. And uh, there is a second uh, thesis I would like to make. The nature of those discoveries which were made by critics, which neither can be described adequately as historicists nor 
adequately as romanticists, is of such a kind that it necessarily leads to a decrease of the importance of the narrative in history, which does not exclude that the narrative remains in an epistemological sense basic. It's not the main uh, way in which history can be written any longer. Although uh, the way in which it is written then might require the availability of the narrative. That is a remark uh, to Professor Mink's um, topic. There was a shift, and that seems to be obvious in that time, from character, event, action, uh, toward interpretation as the subject of history. I mean, not the interpretation of history, but history in itself as a sequence of interpretations. And uh, taking up an issue of Professor White, who who's, uh, founds his entire interpretation on the romantic experience of the being obscure and frightening of the past. What then is it uh, about the past which is frightening and which is obscure? Well, uh, this is a minimal description. The past appears as a, a host of confl conflicting basic structures of experience, all of them not just factual, but structured in such a way that one can argue in favor of them, that one can develop a philosophy from them, which could be possibly maintained even at present. Well, the awareness of uh, a past of this kind, of course, has roots in the present. And Professor White has mentioned some of them. There is, of course, the collapse of the inherited inherited images of the world and the experiences these images came with. There's the claim of radical new ones and there's the conflict, conflict between all of them. What, in my opinion, was restricted in what Professor White said uh, is that this experience originally uh, comes as a frightening one. Uh, as a matter of fact, historically, it came originally as an inspiring one. Inspiring in various respects. Uh, just as an insight, because there was uh, the, uh, the obvious inability to penetrate past structures adequately. Uh, the way in which that could be possibly done became available suddenly. And of course, that was uh, more uh, I think the reason for the uh, inspiration, uh, the, for the being inspired by these possibilities, it was a great resource for criticism. Criticism of unjustified claims uh, or uh, claims that were believed to be unjustified and which were inherited from the past and founded themselves on uh, events in the past. We should remember that uh, the techniques of historical research were developed by theologians originally, and they belong to the context of biblical criticism. Uh, and they were not applied upon political history, as a matter of fact, before uh, the historicists entered. Uh, it's well known that, for instance, we can uh, establish, develop a much uh, more adequate and also more uh, liberal attitude toward uh, the holy sources of the Christian religion if we are able to place these texts in their environment, if we can understand what uh, the process of their generation has been, which is reflected in the text but not really adequately represented in the text, and which then was insufficiently comprehended by the following ages, which had their own structures of experience, such that they never necessarily disguised what was going on in the origins. And then one can return to the origins with a better understanding, but at the same time one can develop the potential of the origins proper and can free oneself from uh, the imposed interpretations, uh, which uh, appeared already at the time of the origination itself, but then over history for reasons one can understand now. Now, uh, without saying more on this, I would like to, to summarize some of the discoveries, because I have to restrict myself to a few minutes, some of the discoveries made by these critics uh, 
which were neither romantics nor uh, historicists. And among them, by the way, some of the famous rom romantics, uh, like Schlegel and so forth, who was not a romantic in those, uh, under those descriptions provided uh, during the colloquium. Uh, I have here five uh, discoveries. The first of them was already mentioned. Interpretation as such defines forms of life in the sense that they are elementary constituents of them, that they are not only imposed upon them, that they are essential parts of them, such that that life is, in some sense, an interpretation of, well, I leave open these uh, uh, variables here. Then secondly, there is a sequence of primarily consistent interpretations, uh, such that it's not so easy to detect superiorities here. Uh, the sequence is, at the beginning, only a historical one, but since uh, the superiority is not easily detected, there is the competition already uh, mentioned, and that, of course, provides the means for, for a possible return to the past. must not necessarily lead to that, because it's also possible to detect further possibilities in the future, and for that reason, Romanticism necessarily can be conservative and revolutionary at the same time. Then, thirdly, there is the coexistence of several interpretations at the same time and possibly in the same form of life uh, which we had, for instance, uh, in, in biblical criticism where there is the experience of the Oriental world as it is articulized in uh, the doctrine of Christ in certain respects. And then there is the imposed interpretation which still is natural because it was the only explicit interpretation available at that time. So there are conflicting uh, interpretations at the same moment in history. And that then leads to the distinction between uh, an interpretation which is basic and a surface interpretation on the other side. And it was one of the discoveries of criticism of that time, which is mainly uh, uh, the merit of uh, Fichte, that the, basic that the basic interpretation has a particular uh, constitution. It is an interpretation of the interpreter, the self uh, that relates itself um, into this form of life, to the world. It's an interpretation of that interpreter and an image of the world as one, in one. This interpretation covers both at the same time and any surface interpretation with respect to that is only a partial one. It's limited in scope. This is, by the way, uh, the uh, underlying premise of existentialism as it is applied to history. And this then, this, this scheme that there, is a, that there is first a basic and then a surface uh, potential of interpretation and that the basic interpretation has a particular uh, structure uh, gives free the possibilities, for instance, for developing the concept of an ideology, which does not really uh, adequately represent the original experience, but which is well motivated as a surface interpretation and still only partial as far as its validity is concerned. That is uh, a means everybody at least is prepared to consider these days and also uh, White's um, interpretation. Uh, relies on the availability of these um, means of interpretation. He actually uh, looks at uh, um, historicism as a sort of an insufficient interpretation, which at the same time is in the guise of the romantic experience. Uh, well, there are other potentials set free uh, from this discovery. For instance, there are new types of criticism which uh, uncover the hidden roots for the generation of images of the world. And we have that, of course, as one of the uh, of surface images of the world. We have that, of course, in Nietzsche, we have it in Freud, and we even have it in Wittgenstein. Well, and there is the fifth uh, discovery then. Uh, the discovery that there is, at least possibly, a necessary sequence of interpretation which is still historical because the underlying 
uh, interpretation, the primary interpretation, uh, which is in, implicit in the form of life of uh, a particular time or particular man, is uh, comprehensive and covers the self-interpretation uh, of um, the interpreter. It cannot be broken up unless from the inside. And that leads to the idea that although the image of the world is primarily consistent, uh, as it develops, it develops also aporiae. We had an example of this uh, this morning in uh, Michael Fried's uh, talk. There is something consistent and then uh, as it is developed, it turns out, out to be aporetical nevertheless. And that's the only way in which uh, there is a chance uh, for change. And actually this is the way in which basic changes in history take place. Well, now uh, this all leads to the conclusion which was my second thesis. If that is now the perspective within which one has to look at history, the range of importance of interpretation reduces drastically the importance of the narratives. Uh, to report events and actions isn't really significant any longer. It doesn't it lead to any understanding. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the resources for this kind of criticism almost completely were developed outside of narrative history. They were developed uh, in connection with particular issues as far as the past is concerned. How to understand adequately what's going on. For instance, as I already mentioned, the biblical criticism, but there is the other question, who was Spinoza as a matter of fact? Or what was the antiquity uh, and uh, the, na the narration of what happened competes uh, unfavorably with the development of conflicting images of what could possibly happen and so forth and then the verification of some of them and even before romanticism was fully developed these resources then were applied to the present what is the French Revolution that is uh, the issue as it was um, uh, introduced by Burke and then continued by Schlegel and so forth. And later on, what is capitalism? And all the interest in the narrative aspect of history is not only any longer um, uh, indirectly, but manifestly guided by questions of this kind. Now, if that is that criticism, which at least um, was developed at that time and which is still undeniably uh, the resource of our own potential of criticism. How then to explain the rhetoric of the historical school in their attempts to write um, these uh, series of volumes which as a matter of fact are narrative but also concedingly by the authors themselves rhetoric in some sense. They are art somehow, and the standards of art were uh, accepted as relevant for writing this kind of narrative uh, presence, and I already asked to write privately, what is the audience of uh, these volumes, after all? Well, there I have a hypothesis. With the um, development of the new resources of criticisms, which are also ours, uh, necessary, they are developed necessarily a split between esoteric and exoteric history. You cannot any longer uh, uh, provide historical information in the way already the ancients provided them and then uh, as it was provided all over the centuries. After you have understood what really has to be done in historical um, uh, interpretation and uh, historical writing. Uh, so, an information about what the history is, well, there is the interest in the past and it's already general, but it cannot be met any longer, cannot be met any longer in the traditional way. Uh, it's necessary, in, in this respect, I appreciate that, it's necessary to have uh, a writing of history which is essentially rhetoric uh, in a stronger sense. Uh, than it was um, in your, in Professor White's uh, account. Uh, 
uh, these, and, and we know they are, they, the, the, the historical school is writing these big works already in the dawn of the narrative history. They are the last ones uh, that were written. Mm, and uh, they were replaced by this uh, kind of a public discussion on history which is partial, which picks up uh, individual issues and puts them into a broader uh, perspective. By the way, this is also the point where nationalism could enter uh, the historical image of the world, because that is a sort of rhetoric uh, which uh, provides still resources for um, a not, esoter not esoteric um, image of history which is nevertheless historical and accepts the importance of uh, the past and the, and, uh, the variation of um, approaches and images and so forth. Uh, I would like to connect this with another thesis. I believe that the discovery of ideology as a structure <coughs> instantaneously increases the need for a new, new type of ideology. Namely that type of ideology which uh, at the surface has the claim that it meets the experience that there are ideologies but which nevertheless in itself remains a surface structure. Because uh, it is available with ease, it's not uh, esoteric in any sense, it can be presented to the general audience, can easily be um, uh, accepted, and so forth. It's one-dimensional, but seemingly meeting the needs of uh, the criticism of the time. Well, a remedy for that, of course, is again history. History in that particularized sense. And... <coughs> This is, I believe, the underlying, uh, the underlying belief every historian has these days when he is aware of the general situation and also of what he really does, namely that his uh, historical discourse remains restricted to a particular problem, which is more or less then uh, significant for all um, present uh, predicaments and so forth. An adequate image of what a historical process is like, which is not exoteric, is available only as a paradigm. And that then, in other words, would be the belief of the historian of these, t these days, that the paradigm as such is a remedy. And we uh, have had this here um, uh, in, in several of the meetings where we had a systematic topic and a historical presentation at the same time. And there is the self-persuasion which uh, the historian must enter that uh, the paradigm as such is already effective as a remedy against uh, the inevitability, the inescapability of the split between esoteric and exoteric uh, history. And this I mean is then the use and the abuse of history every historian necessarily makes as a, a historian, as long as he remains a historian. And that also explains why there is really the need for a theory. Except we have a theory about those processes, uh, the discovery of which we have to attribute to the non-romantics and the non-historicists of the romanticism and historicism times. Uh, unless we can understand these processes in theoretical terms, uh, the ambiguity between use and abuse of history on the side of the historians is inevitable. And uh, for that reason I believe that Cyrus Hemlin had uh, given a brilliant, although entirely ambiguous, uh, formulation of what uh, this meeting was about. <laughs> now call on Professor Yuri Streeter, University of Constance and Harvard.
there is a profound difference between Dieter Henrich and me. Uh, he, as we were told, wrote down his notes during or after lunch. <laughs> I did it during lunch without having lunch, and that's very sensible. And there is another difference. He teaches here every year in English. In America, I do it only every five years and then in Russian. So uh, <laughs> it will be very difficult for me, and that's really not an statement, especially because I'm sitting here on the wrong place, and Hamlin uh, knows this. Uh, my statement, I was invited and was expected to here, was about uh, the, what was the title? Problems of Literary History. And I'm very grateful to you, Hamlin, that you have canceled this. Because that would be, again, a new field, and, and a very complex one. And we had then to present this field with all the problems of history, of literature, of language, and combining all this in 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, and I think that's even for this, for this is this field even uh, worth not to be treated in this way. Uh, so I've decided really not to make a statement, but simply to, to make some remarks about uh, what are the connections between the discussion literary scholars are in for the moment, and I would say in West and in East, some literary scholars, and what are the relation to the problems we have discussed here. And I will concentrate on, especially on one problem, where uh, vividly discussed in the first days, but remaining one of the crucial problems, uh, problems during the whole colloquium. And that was the problem if we can really make an, a difference, a differentiation between the so-called historiographical narrative and the poetic. Uh, one, starting with uh, the lecture of Hayden White and with a book, and I must, must confess that I have started to read the book here during the night, but then it was stolen by Dieter Henrys, uh, and so I couldn't finish. And of course, every literary historian is suspected to speak about books he never read. Uh, it is painful to do, this, uh, to do it before this audience here. And when we tried to make a difference between, between the narrative of the historian and the poetic narrative, there is always some kind of blame, to blame the historian because he narrates like a poet, or because he has narrative, or even a poetical concept, as in the book of White, that's a, the whole concept may be a poetic one, and then it is not historiographical. But then we have to ask, what is the difference? And that remembered me a colloquium we had in poetic hermeneutics about the same topics, about the same problems, two or three years ago, about Geschichten und Geschichte. I, I don't remember exactly. And then it was very clear. We had linguists there, and structural linguists too. And they tried the linguists and the historian for lit of literature more oriented in structure to give this differentiation. And that was impossible. <laughs> because there is no distinctive feature between these both possibilities. And here in this audience, I think uh, it was Professor Dick Stein who told us when we try to make this difference, it's only possible uh, in uh, going back or going forward to the reader and the expectations uh, of uh, the reader, because simply the expectations are different one. But in Germany and in Constance especially, we have the, the Rezeptionsgeschichte and the Rezeptionsästhetik. So all things are things of the reader. So I would be a bit careful with this. I accept absolutely, and I think you are absolutely right. But it is very important to, uh, to realize that it's not only the reader, but it is the author too, and that this kind of uh, different expectation is what the author creates through the texts, too. And then we can really try to understand why both narratives are different, not as much in their structure, but in the intention and the, uh, in the expectation. And then, of course, we see that a poet can use some specific effects of the historiograph, and the historiograph must use poetic devices. But for instance, you have the author of historiography with his special task offers the reader the possibility to check the facts. It may be even an illusion because the reader has not the possibility, but he has always the feeling, I can control, I can check the facts, and if they are wrong, 
or for instance, if they are uh, discovered new facts, falsifying the whole uh, hypothesis, then the whole work is outdated, at least, if not wrong. And that's absolutely different with a poetic work, even a poetic work, a uh, so-called historical novel or something like this, if it's convincing uh, li uh, as a poetic uh, work. Uh, but uh, if we uh, uh, differentiate both systems this way, I think there is a great danger than we then think that we have two different possibilities because uh, even this difference of the expectation of the reader and the intention of the author changes in time and we have in different periods and different cultural uh, con contexts different relations between the poet and the historiographer, between the expectations of historiography and poetry uh, uh, and uh, we have then again to uh, redefine this relation and especially we have different relation between both possibilities and the so-called extra-linguistic reality. Uh, uh, for instance, I can take this, uh, or I will take only this example that Hayden White uh, uh, introduced here and that's one of our topics, the so-called romantic concept and the post-romantic one. Uh, we can say that in Romanticism too, the uh, historiograph starts from so-called given facts uh, and implots them through imagery. Uh, whereas the poet starts from imagery and try to incorporate, to embody then this using only fictitious invention or uh, given facts from history, so he can combine this. But on, in both cases, then, you have the emphasis of this kind of imaginary, of subjective vision, individual vision or collective vision, and the consciousness that that's a construction, that that's a kind of vision, and here was used the word, and I think you were in white, with the imposed vision. Both are conscious, the romantic historiographer and history philosopher and poet, that it is really an imposed vision, starting from different points. One starting from the facts, the other starting from imagery. And that's different uh, after the romanticism, and we have to redefine uh, both now, because now poetry is... Uh, more orientated on history and history as given facts of reality. And of course, again, we have the historian starting from facts, but he has to change his attitude. He, he, he both now try to deny or to at least to reduce or to camouflage this subjective imposed vision. Uh, you can do it uh, uh, in the utopian attempt that you can deny your subject, uh, your own uh, sub su subjective yes, uh, vision. You have to be hermeneutics with my long language. That's all. I, I can't help me. Uh, uh, that you have to uh, to disappear as the writer. That's famous Ranke with with also the 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 Dinge the S gewesen. That's the one possibility. The other possibility is, I would say, if this is a reduction of, subject, uh, of uh, individuality, the other is a, a, a plurification or a multiplication of, uh, of subjectivity or individuality. You can show that there are facts from different perspectives. The same event or the same fact can be given this uh, from this uh, standpoint, from this standpoint, from this standpoint, and you have to review different uh, aspects in the scholarship, in the science, for instance. That's a famous footnote. You understand? You need a narrative, so you give it in the text, but then you say, this historian uh, interpreted it this way, this way here, this here, this here, and so you have this intersubjective uh, possibility to control it through different perspectives, and the reader uh, himself has to decide it. And I think that you have both possibilities in the post-romantic uh, poetry or literature too, and we can even uh, now distinct two phases interacting both. Uh, we can say that, for instance, the first one, uh, the so-called realism, was of, cor of course aware, the great realists were aware 
that you that that's fiction, and you can't you can't uh, escape from this fiction when you are a writer. But they try to make the effect if there is no subject, uh, if they are really the the <coughs> things uh, speak of self. You know this in 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 Flaubert, for instance that the writer disappears, that the narrator disappears, and there is only this style and, uh, given immediately. That's one of the possibilities. And I think the theory of this, for instance, one of the possible theories is, it was told once, that the realism as a literary school is the only school really where the main device is to avoid metaphors or figurative speak, because that makes aware that you are not directly speaking, you will make the impression that there are things and not rhetorical figures. So you, you avoid figures very clearly, seeing that you are comparing different fields and so on. And you can really analyze this. I think it's a bit exaggerated, but it is an approach to realism from the stylistic side that's very uh, interesting. Uh, whereas in later development, even in the late realism, but then in that what we call uh, modernism, you have the purification of, uh, or the multiplication of perspectives. Uh, that you give different perspectives, that you destroy the possibility to approach uh, 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 reality as such in literature, or the device of montage, or of alienation. So you have this kind too, and you see what I wanted to uh, show here, that you have then to redefine uh, the relation between poetry, uh, or poetic structure, uh, and historiographical one, or the function of history and poetry, and of both to this given socio-cultural context. So that we can, of course, say you have different structures, but at the same time, I would say it's not enough because you cannot give distinctive features. You have to see that we have different structures with different uh, intentions and expectations in different contexts. And that's compl uh, complicated uh, enough but then you have far more the complication that within all uh, fields where we have written texts or works of art, you have the possibility that an elder work written in a different context, semiotically speaking, uh, uh, related to absolutely different codes, is decoded under a new condition. That's the famous question for Marxists too. How can Homer affect in this way? So we have, I think, and that was my point here, what's the task of uh, literary science as literary history, but not only history for this moment. Uh, and there are groups uh, working about this theoretically and historically in East and West. Uh, the one problem is to describe or to uh, elaborate models for general description of possible linguistic systems, genres in the, in the widest sense of the word. The other one is to create models to describe specific cultural structures as systems, being aware that both are only models and not real reality that this description of a society is not this society, but simply a model. And then to interrelate both, but not in the sense of mirroring, that the structure of the one mirrors the other, and even not of direct causal correspondence, but simply to uh, see how and why a specific system can have a specific function under specific conditions. And uh, I think that's, of course, a very ambitious task, and I'm skeptical about the possibility to come to an end with this task, but I would say, in paradox, me, that that's an optimistical, uh, optimistic skepticism, because as long as we can try to do this, and there are some approaches to this, uh, we see the possibility of man to have general possibilities at his choice to uh, achieve specific effects, specific function, in a specific situation. And that's not uh, relativism, because then we can really decide in what situation, what structure is adequate to have a specific aspect. We have a, a, a bit, a little, little chance of choice and freedom. And this way, uh, I would say, as artist, as historian, as thinker, and simply as man, too, to finish with a rhetorical figure. Thank <laughs> you.
just if uh, subsequent speakers get hold of one of these nice empty blue chairs, turn it round to face the audience, sit in it, and uh, <coughs> relax. But there is one empty chair right up here. Yeah. Yeah. Professor Woodman would like to occupy it. I call on Professor Woodman anyway to address the meeting for not more than ten minutes. Well, I'll just sit here. Uh, I promise to keep this under ten this minutes. This is a better with Nick microphone. Yeah. And I prepared these notes at 6 o'clock this morning, so I think I'm the, uh, in, the real fellow. in order of time. Uh, and I've written it out because I think this is the best way to, to uh, make sure that I, I remain within the scheduled time, and I can see the clock and reflection up there. Uh, there's one large comment or observation that I'd like to make, and it rises uh, directly from the colloquium. And it concerns a subject that I have not thought about prior to this colloquium, at least in this particular way. And indeed, these uh, remarks or this comment arises directly from the, the papers and the discussion that's taken place in the last three days. Uh, as I say, I wrote it at 6 o'clock this morning, and I haven't read it since, so I don't know <laughs> how it will come out. But it concerns the historicity of the prelude. Uh, the subject of the prelude, or one way of formulating it, is what Coleridge calls the sacred power of self-intuition. The poem explores Wordsworth's process of intuiting himself. Describing this sacred power, which both Coleridge and Wordsworth say is the imagination, Coleridge, in his Biographia, writes that the self is a subject which becomes a subject only by constructing itself objectively to itself, but never is an object except as it is at the same time a subject the self, in short, uh, becomes a self, that is, self-aware, by seeing itself in the mirror it constructs. In the prelude, the mirror, or really, I think there are several mirrors, um, reveal uh, different images of the one subject. One mirror uh, offers a highly circuitous journey narrative in search of what Wordsworth calls the hiding places of man's power, which have a tendency in the prelude uh, to open as he advances and then to close as he approaches. The image is that of a quester in search of a sacred treasure buried in a hidden cave, uh, guarded against entry by the film of familiarity, which reduces the mind, says Wordsworth, to a state of almost savage torpor. Another mirror reveals an image of the poet as both prophet and priest. As prophet, he is the mouthpiece of the god within the mind, the agent of the one great mind, revealing the holy word. As priest, he sacramentally renders the word in what Wordsworth calls the matins and vespers of holy verse. The reader or audience for this latter sacramental vision is a communicant. Uh, the ideal reader or communicant is, of course, Coleridge, to whom the poem uh, is addressed. Uh, Coleridge, in his poem, tells us that while Wordsworth chanted the poem to him aloud, uh, he made his confession, and at the close, as the song passed into his heart, like the reaper's song into the heart of Wordsworth, uh, he was uh, presumably granted absolution. At least, he found himself in prayer with a vision of Wordsworth like an icon before his eyes. Now, what I think distinguishes this kind of historicity from the kind that uh, Hayden White uh, has in mind, or I think he has in mind, I have not read his book, I, I am basing this entirely on his, on his paper, uh, is not the use of rhetoric, which is common to both, but the degree of consciousness that enters into it. Hayden White uh, suggested that historicism might be defined as a suppressed rhetoric. Poetry is realized, consciously realized rhetoric, Romantic poetry focuses upon rhetoric as rhetoric, uh, to the ex almost to the exclusion of everything else. And it focuses in this way because it conceives of rhetoric in a very different way. In historicism, as an art, the function of rhetoric is to make us see what is there by making what is there an object. Uh, the rhetoric of the historian renders facts, documents, an object of study, which I think is the point that Michael Fried was making in coming to the defense of, of Hayden White. Now, 
rhetoric in romantic poetry functions not to make us see what is there so much as to conjure what is not there, at least to the visible sense. All objects as objects, says Coleridge in his Biographia, with reference to the imagination, all objects as objects are fixed and dead. Rhetoric, or romantic rhetoric and romantic poetry, brings them to life, or rather to a magical illusion of life. Rhetoric in the prelude functions to restore a dead boy to life. It functions to bridge a gap, a great divide, which is death itself, death and the terrible silence of death. Rhetoric, and I think that uh, uh, Jeffrey Hartman brought this out beautifully in his analysis uh, of the Danish boy. And I think rhetoric raises ghosts, the Danish boy, for example. Uh, rhetoric is the casting of spells. The opening lines of Tintern Abbey, which Morris uh, Dickstein referred to, are in one sense incantation, summoning the dead. It works to make the picture of the mind revive again. Now, I think Hayden White would be the first uh, to uh, argue that the historian should not use rhetoric to summon the past in this way. Indeed, I think he used the word sacrilegious in thinking of the historian using rhetoric uh, to perform some redemptive task. But it is clearly not sacrilegious of Wordsworth uh, writing uh, his history uh, of his own mind. And yet, there is in Romanticism, among the Romantic poets, uh, a growing interest in the so-called historical consciousness. It arises, I think, in part from the Romantic anxiety about the uses to which the Romantic poet puts his rhetoric. Shelley, for example, in comparing the poet to an alchemist, clearly does not believe in alchemy any more than we do. Coleridge, speaking of the magical power of the imagination, does not believe in magic. Keats, arguing that the imagination is like Adam's dream, he awoke and found it true, went on in the fall of Hyper uh, Hyperion to denounce the dreamer. And Wordsworth, I think, is not at home in the Zion of his imagination. He wears his priestly robes with a difference. His matins and vespers are the imperfect sounds to which the mind's internal echo uh, contributes something closer to the truth. He knows he is not a knight wandering in a country of romance. And when he uses this image to describe himself and his adventures in France during the revolution, there is sh surely a terrible Don Quixote irony involved. But in Peacock's Age of Reason, how does the romantic poet image or mirror the poet's vocation? Except by using the old images derived from obsolete modes of knowledge, magic, alchemy, religion, ironically conceived. The poet I tentatively, the romantic poet I tentatively suggest, confronts the possibility of a genuinely historical consciousness as the sane and rational use of rhetoric to make objects, uh, to make the past appear objectively as in itself it was. In contrast to the magical rhetoric uh, of pseudo or illusory resurrection. Shelley, for example, as Dr. Frankenstein, which is the way his Mary attended to see him. Uh, there is, in other words, in the rhetoric of Romanticism, very deeply embedded within it, the rhetoric of anxiety, the rhetoric not of belief, but of the suspension of disbelief. And this suspension of disbelief, I think, becomes less and less willing the longer uh, it goes on. Thank you very much, Professor Woodman. I now call on Professor Paul Hernardi of the University of Rochester. <coughs> Either of these chairs, they're both wired for sound. I will try to make this very brief. Uh, I would like to call attention to uh, the genre of uh, historical reality. I don't think it is a tale whether 
or not told by an idiot. Uh, if anything, it is a play. And I think that um, it is uh, quite, uh, I don't mean play now in the sense of homo ludens, but in the sense of uh, agents uh, doing their own thing rather than um, um, uh, being quoted by a central consciousness. Uh, even uh, if a central consciousness such as uh, God is presupposed, the conventional metaphor would be uh, the world is uh, a theater and in Calderon's great theater of the world, this is the situation uh, in which even the um, uh, uh, monotheistic view of history is cast. Now, if this is the case, then I think um, we have an interesting paradox um, uh, when we consider historical drama. Historical drama does not pretend to be uh, factual history. Uh, and uh, yet, it is cast in a, a generic mode, which would give the playwright a chance to pretend this rather successfully. The playwright is not present. He lets his characters do their thing. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, I think that uh, historiography is um, narrative in, in nature. I think I understand what uh, Professor Hendrick means by modern historiography moving away from, from narrative. I think uh, perhaps uh, what is meant is that it is not a chronicle of uh, events one after the other, but it uh, superimposes interpretive structures. Uh, uh, very strongly. But somehow I think that as an account of past events from a present um, uh, point of view, uh, historiography cannot help but uh, have uh, this major feature of, uh, of narrative, whether fic fictive or, or, or uh, at least uh, in, uh, in intention um, factual. Uh, and uh, therefore I think that uh, historiography somehow extends between uh, clear-cut statements of uh, the historiographer's uh, uh, ideology um, on the one hand, and then direct quotation of uh, documents or verbal events which happened uh, on the other. So uh, somehow it would seem to me that as opposed to historical drama where the playwright has to um, uh, introduce spe specific devices in order to somehow uh, come back through the window once he has left through the door. Uh, uh, in, in historiographical narrative, there is al always um, a central consciousness speaking, uh, uh, a very narratorial uh, voice. Now, if uh, this is the case, then um, uh, I think uh, it is remarkable uh, that the very uh, fact that a historiographer is willing to uh, mediate in structure, that he does not try to resort to drama, a simple unedited presentation of uh, documents, uh, would tend to suggest that uh, even uh, though he might claim um, historicity and factual um, uh, relevance, um, he is embracing a way of the a mode of discourse which uh, gives away the fact that uh, when we are talking about what other people did in the past we cannot help but mediate and uh, therefore i think the medium uh, quite often belies the message which pretends to be a factual representation of past events thank you Now my pleasure to call on Professor Hamlin, like one of those orchestral conductors who also play bassoon, to take part in his own colloquium. <laughs> often, often. I, uh, I can't resist the opportunity to sit between Francis Barshot and Dieter Henrich for a few minutes. <laughs> I had meant to keep silence. It seems to me the appropriate curse that should be passed on any organizer of a colloquium like this. On the other hand, it seems to me that so many of you have spoken so eloquently in response to requests from me that the least I could do was offer a kind of tribute in response uh, in terms of uh, a self-parody. In fact, what I will read is a kind of fairy tale 
and I hope I can find the tone of irony which would indicate the degree to which I distrust it. I wrote it at six o'clock this morning, <laughs> more as a result of fatigue and indigestion, I think, than any true insight. Uh, well, <clears throat> in trying to gather my thoughts in response to all that has been said at this colloquium, I feel an embarrassment. There is a sense of inadequacy in the face of receding insight, something like the sense of a necessary failure in the, on the model of the carpe diem or the verweile doch, which has been seen here as one of the dilemmas of time for the poetic self. If there is indeed some sense of spirit, Weltgeist or genius loci, which has been conjured or evoked by our various speakers, my feeling is that this spirit still resists embodiment or incarnation, despite all eloquence, and this may reflect a frustration appropriate to what Hayden White would call our figures of speech. These figures, insofar as they succeed in taking on form at all, remain necessarily separate and distinct from the powers which they seek to grasp or comprehend, in the sense here of Hölderlin's opening line in Patmos, na ist und schwer zu fassen der Gott. Or perhaps, thinking back to Jeffrey Hartman's inspiring, indeed spellbinding interpretation of Goethe's Earl King, is not our task very much like that of the father in the ballad? We are trying to find our way home through a dark and threatening spirit land, and we come to realize only gradually, like the rider by night and wind, that the power which surrounds us and also inspires the sense of urgency to the ride threatens to destroy whatever is most responsive to it. The child we carry with us, which we struggle to sustain and protect, is perhaps aware of the ghost in ways which we can only guess at in our daytime sense of consciousness. But it is doomed also to fall victim to that ghost, to become itself a Nebelstreif in bondage to the Earl King, and what we are likely to arrive home with is not the incarnation of spirit into word, but indeed a corpse, a body which is silent. I must plead forgiveness of the practicing historians, if there are any left among us, <laughs> in suggesting that this silence may be appropriate and even necessary as an outcome to our endeavor. In this, I suppose I am more of a romantic than a historicist, in either the good or the bad sense of the word, and I look to the poets for guidance and reassurance, even though I do not confuse, as I am sure Hayden White does not either, contrary to some of the critical comments that have been directed to him, I do not confuse my figures of speech with the objects or the powers or the voices which they seek to represent. But I do have a point to make which may perhaps constitute a legitimate response to this colloquium. I am haunted by the figure of the naked saint in Wackenroder's fairy tale about the wheel of time, which Steve Scher presented to us. The saint ascended in death upwards toward the moonlit sky above the lovers in their boat on the river. And to the lovers, this spirit in the air seems to be the spirit of music. This sense of a disembodied spirit opposes the impression I receive from our discussions of language, whether as rhetorical figures of thought, narrative structures of plot or story, or poetic recollections of the past, which have affirmed the nature of word or speech act as mediation, where the logos is never the primal deed as Faust said it should be, at least in his native German. And the sense of spirit is only an intuition of what remains always, like the unredeemed past, beyond words. And this brings me, at last, to my point. Does not the problem of history, or even the sense of time itself, establish for poetry, and even for prose, if it so wishes, a direction or a dimension of meaning which demands an alternative model for the referential capacities of language to that of mimesis or realism as the representation of what is or was as part of an objective reality.
instead of a mimetic reference to a reality of facts and truths and things, language would here refer to that which lies beyond it in time and the recovery of what has been lost, whether it is personal experience or public history, consists in an exercise of recollection which is necessarily poetic, that is, creative. What would seem to separate the historian from the poets and perhaps also from the literary critics ought not therefore, excuse me, ought not therefore to be the question of what is or was real or what truly happened, but rather the question of how we may relate to what was and recover some sense of it in and through our use of language. At this point, I would like to retreat, referring again to Wackenroder's fairy tale, uh, to a distinction between different modes of discourse which serve different functions or motives of reference. At one extreme would be the goal or the ideal of music, like the spirit of the uh, naked saint. If we truly sing, and I suppose only the lovers in the boat would ever be likely to, it would not be in our own voice at all, but rather in or with the spirit of music. This might be called a norm of poetic language as romantic rhapsody, which is surely beyond us. At the other extreme would be the goal or the standard of the practicing historian, where the rhetoric of fiction is made subordinate, as far as possible, to the documents from the archives, where the act of assembling the chronicle re resembles the exercise of turning the wheel of time. Somewhere in between these two poles, we might locate the actual practice of both the poets, especially those who are content with narrative instead of song, and the critics and teachers. As a teacher of literature, and by intention at least a critic of poetry, I feel suspended in an uneasy dialectic between the archives, turning the wheel of time, and the boat on the river, listening to the voices of song. And I am certain that the motive for the long hours in the archives, not to mention the study, the office, and the classroom, is really the possibility, as well as the memory, of authentic song. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is try and define a convergence uh, that I perceive among a number of the uh, papers that have been delivered, a convergence on a kind of idealism. Uh, that'll be five paragraphs. Uh, in a sixth paragraph, talk about a dilemma that that uh, seems to be getting us into. And in a seventh paragraph, not propose a solution, but very romantically issue a plea. Um, first, uh, I noticed that a great many of the interpretive papers which have been presented have all concerned uh, works of art uh, in which there is a beholder. Uh, Michael Fried this morning was talking about the problem of the beholder, I should say, in paintings. Uh, Jeffrey Hartman talking about the beholder uh, in The Boy of Winander, looking at the grave. Uh, Yuri Streeter talking about uh, the historian in uh, Boris Godunov. Uh, just to illustrate that this isn't uh, only a concern of romantic art, the art of the romantic period, I might also mention Michel Foucault's reading of Las Meninas in Les Moelles les Choses, which also concerns the problem of beholding. Uh, second, um, these papers have also had in common something further, it seems to me, which is that um, they all treat form as a kind of exclusion. Uh, in the case of Michael Fried's paper this morning, uh, Jericho's painting at the end, form is the exclusion of the beholder. Uh, in the case of the boy of Winander, form uh, as the exclusion of the reader, in the sense that the author there looking at the grave takes the place uh, of uh, uh, where normally the reflective reader would stand looking at his object. Uh, in the case of the Elkonish, which Jeffrey Hartman also talked about, uh, the exclusion there is the exclusion of the characters uh, who die in the course, of, or rather the one character who dies in the course of the ballad, and it's only that death which allows the reflective distance to be established, which you find in the last stanza of the ballad. Uh, a whole series of exclusions then. Uh, third, 
there seems to be a convergence among all these exclusions or a tendency uh, to treat, um, a tendency to find the primary exclusion as the exclusion of history itself. I'm rem I was reminded of that by Professor Rosenblum's paper this morning. He showed us a whole series of paintings uh, desperately trying to include history in works of art until finally at the end uh, painting seemed to find its destiny uh, with a work of art from which history was excluded, all those nameless faces lying on the ground. Um, another example might be the painting Michael Fried talked about this morning, wherever Michael Fried is, uh, the painting Michael Fried talked about this morning, uh, uh, which contains a wreath of art being given from one person to another, uh, but in which uh, the content of the painting is pure gesture. It's pure gesture because you don't know whether the wreath is being given or being taken. Uh, it's pure gesture in the sense that the history, the narrative, has been excluded. There's no action in the painting, no meaning. Uh, that seemed to be an isolated example, but it seems to be characteristic uh, of one major current of aesthetics uh, represented uh, in the 20th century by new criticism. Uh, new criticism treats the work of art as something which excludes uh, an external history, excuse me, excludes a history and embodies the kind of ambiguity that Michael Fried was talking about in connection with that wreath. Um, that is to say that the exclusion of history is not uh, simply a chance phenomenon uh, involved in some of the works that have been talked about, but it's a, it's a central phenomenon uh, of art as perceived by an important school. Uh, fourth, a number of the people uh, who have talked, uh, a number of our interpreters in this group, have um, referred uh, repeatedly to a notion which they describe, which Michael Fried described this uh, morning as the dilation of the moment, uh, substitution of a ex spatial expansion for the temporal progression which you find in history. Uh, and I'd like to just dwell on that concept for a moment, bring in Lessing's uh, phrase, which hasn't been dropped yet, the pregnant moment. Um, because there's a curious kind of dialectic involved in the phrase, the pregnant moment, uh, which leads to the same exclusion of history that you find, uh, that I've been finding in a number of the papers. Uh, and that's very simply, pregnancy takes nine months. It lasts for a long time. Uh, it's not just a moment. Uh, pregnancy is what produces birth. Uh, it's what produces uh, life, but it also precedes birth uh, and endures uh, for a uh, great many moments. Um, the pregnant moment in Lessing is a dramatic representation, but it's a representation which is also a long, patient anticipation uh, of meaning. It's a, a representation which is a postponement of action. Lessing uh, substitutes the sculpture for the story. Uh, I'm not sure about the reading of Lessing. Uh, but I am sure that there seems to be a convergence on a, on a very idealist and kind of anti-historical bias. Uh, Michael Fried was our greatest idealist uh, this morning when he uh, talked about form, uh, excuse me, when he talked about content as just a modality of form. Um, <laughs> uh, he was trying to describe a way in which... <laughs> Uh, maybe there'll be some response. He was trying to, <laughs> uh, trying to describe uh, the fact that the choice of a historical subject matter is not uh, determined by a concern for history, but a concern for the solution of certain formal problems. Uh, that sounds terribly reductionist, and my uh, fifth point would be that it's not as reductionist as it sounds. Even if there is a convergence on a treatment of form as the exclusion of history, nevertheless, there are a lot of different ways of excluding history. Or to use Jeffrey Hartman's word, there are a lot of different kinds of pastoral. Uh, there is, for example, Foucault's reflection uh, in that reading of Las Meninas. Uh, there is Rousseau's passivity in the fifth of the Reveries of Solitary Wonder. Uh, there's Goethe's eroticism in the Verweile doch du bist so schön. Uh, there's a very similar phrase to Verweile doch du bist so schön in, in the fifth of the Reveries, but I don't believe that it includes any uh, comparable word to the word schön. Uh, beauty in the eroticism is, I think, uh, Goethe's edition. Um, the last variety. Uh, of these three that I happen to mention, uh, the three different varieties of excluding history. The last variety seems to me uh, Michelet's variety, as I understand it from Lionel Gossman's paper. Uh, Michelet is so in love with history that he turns history into a myth. Uh, he takes history out of history. Two more minutes. Uh, my sixth point uh, is that 
Uh, if there is a convergence, there also seems to be the danger of too much agreement. Uh, it's been very nice to have the skeptics around uh, who remind us that our uh, idealist bias uh, is not the only possible one. Um, uh, who reminds us that there's a history out there, uh, active, in addition to the history passively contained or implied or passively uh, denied uh, within the works of art. Uh, the problem is that the more the idealist camp converges, uh, the more these exclusionists seem to have in common with one another, the more difficulty they find talking to the other camp. So that the uh, meeting seems to me to have uh, moved uh, uh, slightly in, uh, away from uh, the direct, uh, slightly away from being a meeting about romanticism and history, uh, and historicism, and slightly in the direction of being a meeting about romanticism versus historicism. And I'm reminded of uh, Professor Mink. Um, one more minute. I'll get there. Uh, I'm reminded of of uh, Professor Mink, uh, who uh, informed us that the great romantic aesthetician Schiller uh, was also profoundly blind to history. Uh, Professor Mink then reminding us of this opposition between romanticism and history. I can only state it very simply. Um, after all of this, uh, you can either see works of art uh, passive as passive products of history uh, passive products of ideology, or you can see romantic, or, excuse me, or you can see works of art as active producers of ideas. It's very difficult for us to find any way to see them as something other than that. We need to find some kind of middle voice of history uh, in order to write the history of art, some kind of actions without actors or history without names. That gets me to my plea, which was going to be a plea for Wolfling, uh, our historian of art without names. Uh, I think there's a hermeneutic buried in Wolfling's work. Uh, and especially in his dissertation, which is concerned with architecture and very little read, uh, I think there's a hermeneutic buried in there which might offer an alternative to us, uh, and might offer us an alternative to the hermeneutic on which we seem to be converging in this meeting. To explain, as a wholly ignorant chairman, I'm concerned solely with quantity and not with quality, and I call... <laughs> Um, the next name is that of Professor Jonathan Arrack of Princeton University. I find that in some ways I'm continuing Marshall Brown's reflections on exclusion, although in a different way perhaps. Hayden White reminded us at the very beginning of our conference of the need to interrogate language to comprehend the anxiety and strategies of distancing that are involved in our, our uses of language. And I'm going to look, perhaps like Professor Woodman, at questions of belief and disbelief, but at our own talk rather than that of romantic poets. I might begin by thinking for a moment about Morris Dickstein's warning lest we fall into romantic mythological categories in seeing romanticism as discontinuous with, with something, for the moment, we'll say. And he went on to demonstrate the values of consolation, a value that we think of as very different from discontinuity, that Wordsworth offered to his age and to succeeding generations, another form of continuity. And yet it seemed to me that especially in the use that he made of Poulet's studies in human time that one could see this wholly the other way, that what was an anxiety in the 16th and 17th and 18th century in Poulet's large schema has finally, by Wordsworth's time, ceased to be an anxiety. Whatever it was that was feared has happened. And with that loss, one can then move to consolation so that Finally, in Professor Dickstein's scheme, Wordsworth's continuity is with us rather than what, with what came before. Well, okay. Now, Professor Fry offered us another large scheme of how we might see Romanticism as discontinuous. He spoke about the period in which religion was the source, both metaphysically and empirically, church bells, church festivals of time. And although he didn't carry on this particular contrast, we can take the systems of Spengler or Weber and say melodramatically 
that the time of the church yielded to the time of compound interest and factory clocks at some point between the Middle Ages and now or Romanticism or both. Well, in this context, I, I want to reflect on some of the metaphorical language used by Professor Abrams and Professor Dickstein in talking about Wordsworth yesterday. Professor Abrams began with Wordsworth saving time in a metaphoric of religious sacrament. And Professor Dickstein continued this term with a gradual modulation that finally came to, seemed to me, consciousness when he finally said Wordsworth built up a bank of capital in his experience, in his poetry. And Professor Abrams finished by speaking of how costly to him Wordsworth's experience had been. So that we had, in 10 minutes of, of discourse, a movement from the sacramental to the profane, from the world of the church to the world of compound interest in talking about poetry. This, you know, this indeed, as Professor Miller has brought to our attention, is repetition with a difference. And raises, you know, raises the question, what does it mean that this apparently unconscious metaphoric slippage corresponds to what we will grant in Spengler and Frey and Weber is a myth of uh, historical rupture? Well, it's no accident that it was after this uh, exchange of Professor Abrams and Professor Dickstein that Hayden White said he missed the Marxist perspective. <laughs> now, I don't, you know, I don't claim to be offering that, in fact, but just some reflections on our, on our attention to our language and what it suggests. Now, Professor Hughes, despite his close attention in his paper to the language on the page of his text, cited, it seemed to me, very curiously, under the category theater, two passages that spoke of counterfeit and didn't have the space in his paper to relate this metaphoric of counterfeit to the central issue of his paper, the age of publicitate that Hegel characterized. That is, in another myth, we might say in primitive times, verbal exchange was of sounds, economic exchange of goods. In modern times, verbal exchange is in print, economic exchange as is, is in money, which is subject, both print and money indeed, to counterfeit. So that it seems to me that in our language and in the, our, you know, you know, with, I'll, I'll say, it seems to me these slippages in language were not noticed, that they are unconscious, that they do represent in in vaguely Freudian terms, a repression of something, and Mar uh, Marshall Brown was suggesting that what was being repressed, excluded in our discourse, as we chose to see it excluded in the works of art that we talked about, is precisely history in that form that the archival researchers most like to look at. Thank you. I call him Professor Faulkner, University of Toronto. Like you, sir, I'm concerned with time. I'm going to catch up some time. I'd like to stay here because I shall be very brief. I had a question, not a position paper in summary, uh, which <coughs> I, since I'm supposed to know about genetics, I'll give you at least the genesis of my question. I wrote it down just before today's two position, this afternoon's two position papers, which is slightly unfortunate because I think that uh, Professor Henrich stated it, and Professor Streeter maybe answered it, but not quite as specifically as I'd like. The question is concerned with what one goes away with from something like this. I'm going away, as you see, with the usual kind of depressing document, uh, read more Herder, and all the things that we've all got <laughs> tucked away in, in our files and perhaps elsewhere. Uh, when I ask myself what I will be very shortly going away with, I've, I say I because I can't identify with the us and them which uh, we started <laughs> off with. Uh, I think I've learned a lot about historicism in the two senses, at least two. Uh, I'm not so sure about romanticism. The only thing I think I've learned about romanticism, apart from uh, a lot about Wordsworth, is perhaps that there still are people who believe that French romanticism exists. And since I work in this field and have believed for a long time with Claude Pichois that it doesn't, 
I find that rather interesting, but that's, that's a private reflection. I would remind you, however, on the other side of this sheet, there is a, a title, not just a subtitle, but a title which says Romanticism and Historicism. And it's the nature of that conjunction that it seems to me some of the historians of ideas and other learned people haven't maybe faced up to it completely. Uh, I thought we were going to get there when we learned that history was, after all, just a form of literature. And when immediately after Lionel Gossman uh, showed us how literary Michelet was, I'm sure that, at least in Toronto, the Michelet shells will be empty for uh, some time and probably elsewhere. Now, when one has this conjunction, uh, one thinks of in the same years Balzac was writing what I suppose Hillis Miller would call a narrative as pseudo-history, and one sees history <coughs> having become poetry, or something like poetry, one begins to wonder what the nature of the language we have to talk about to explain this conjunction. The traditional explanation is a positive one. Uh, Standard, I think it said, at some point, we can no longer write novels because uh, history itself has become a much better novel. Uh, so that one won't do, I don't think, anymore. We're not satisfied with the sensibility changed, things happened, and therefore literature was different. That doesn't quite satisfy us anymore. On the other hand, I'm not completely satisfied with the simply chronological, Michelet was writing this kind of Hugolian antithesis, as so was Hugo. There we are, there's no connection except uh, coincidence. And it seems to me the, the one thing that some of our experts in, in the history of ideas perhaps could, in the time that remains, when they get a chance to uh, talk to, <laughs> is what is the nature of that and that connection. And I say Professor Streeter hinted at one of the languages that there might be. I think I assume he was referring perhaps to a semiotics of culture. Maybe he was thinking of Echo, maybe he was thinking of uh, Yuri Lottman, I don't know. But I'd like to hear more about it because that's the big question mark in my mind. Thank you. Some of the uh, program speakers have <coughs> suggested they want to offer further comments, and the first of these is Professor Peter Hughes. When I was listening to um, Lewis Mink's comment about the shifting significance of event, something that I'd like to explore in these comments, I was struck by the fact that he rightly said that the event as something that is publicly witnessed and really of an era uh, and a sense of grand significance. The, the notion, for example, that historical events are kings and battles type events is something that becomes more and more re-examined during the period we're concerned with. And I would agree with uh, James Cameron, uh, not only prudently since he's about to follow me, that um, the um, proper way to understand event is in its more commonplace sense of usage, that is not to try to make of it a scientific term. But what I would like to suggest as a possible linking of some of our discussions is that what occurs during this period in both the writing of history and the writing of literature is a twofold process that I think can only be seen in a certain way of approaching language study, and that is that while the great event was being progressively dissolved down from the kings and battles to the nail and shoe type of interpretation, that there was also an interpretation upward in which phenomena that had not previously been considered events or were considered to be fraudulent or bogus events or non-events become increasingly important and significant. In uh, a social and historical sense, groups that did not matter, the dirty people with no names, uh, the women, the children, the criminals, become matters of, of importance and significance. But it seems to me that in literature, too, a whole variety of non-events start to become events. Various forms, and we've uh, heard some comments from uh, uh, Ross Woodman and uh, uh, at greater length to Jeffrey Hartman on the, the significance of the magical or the ghostly. And it's worth noting here that they are becoming increasingly significant because although the cause may be uh, fraudulent or counterfeit, the results are really quite horrifying. Uh, Dr. Frankenstein is practicing uh, bogus chemistry, but he makes a very real monster. And this kind of phenomenon seems to me to be uh, increasingly important during this period, that the earlier notion that event is what is notarized or what occurs on the, the, uh, in a hierarchical order is increasingly being violated from below by this other conception of event. 
Another way of putting this is to note that increasingly you have the insistence and the importance of perfect memory because it's only through memory that it is possible to articulate or to express these non-events, to make them events. And I don't know whether this is something that others could contradict me uh, uh, in, but I've been very struck in reading writers of this period at the number of writers who claim, with good reason, a, an almost perfect memory, an extraordinary power of recall. So it seems to me that, that in the uh, narratives that we're concerned with here, there is a twofold process going on. And it's not only in the language literary text, but also in what Mario Pratz calls the language of images, which was taken up uh, in great detail uh, today, uh, especially in the papers by Michael Fried and Robert Rosenblum. And you will notice that both there and in Lionel Gossman's discussion uh, of Michelet, that the importance of antithesis, of contrast, was developed. It seems to me that this is a manifestation of the conflict of the two conceptions of event, the two meanings of event, the constant sense of antithesis, it seems to me, is very often the permissible being pitted against the impermissible, the uh, approved against the uh, uh, perhaps unspeakable or the unapprovable. And it seems to me, too, that in Michael Fried's paper, he touched upon uh, an important, uh, and uh, certainly uh, far beyond my means to resolve, an important problem. And that is that the type of portrait, the type of picture, excludes the beholder, it turns away from him. And <coughs> my impression would be that the first kind of event, the disintegrating event, is one that requires the witness or the presence of a spectator or an audience, whereas the second kind does not. It seems to me that it is this new kind of event that is being increasingly seen in romantic art. And as uh, Michael Fried insisted, and I think we should consider the consequences of this, this choice of history rather than allegory is essentially the choice of the new type of event over the old, because the old kind of event was no longer, I think, widely acceptable and hence was increasingly made ludic or allegorical. And if you don't have the history, which makes you know what the meaning is, you can't make up your mind. It's rather like the figures of statuary in last year at Marienbad, in which without the history, without the story, you can't know the significance of the object. Uh, it seems to me, too, that this leads to my final point, which is that uh, Dieter Henrich uh, called for a stronger rhetoric, and uh, uh, Yuri Streeter uh, spoke of the need for specific, but also um, uh, valid in general, uh, language studies or systems for this kind of, of uh, endeavor. And it seems to me that the stronger rhetoric emerges if we recall that this conflict, this dual process of disintegration and uh, creation of events can be matched and seen in the notion, the increasing notion during this period, that reality itself was becoming unstable, not only in a philosophical sense, in the sense that uh, things can be reduced to sensation, but also in the uh, historical and the social sense that uh, Exile, for example, would become accepted as the norm. War would become, through this period, uh, the, in a sense, expectancy rather than peace. And I'm very much reminded of the importance of this uh, element of uh, exile during the period. And I think that it may help to account for the uh, extraordinary way in which an unstable reality becomes manifested in the work that people were writing. I say this in particular because it seems to me that the uh, chief uh, alteration that I would uh, like to see in, in a book that I've admired greatly, Meta History, would be some doubts on Hayden White's part and on ours too uh, about Auerbach's notion that reality as uh, a subject in literature or in historical writing is in fact a constant. I'm inclined to agree with Erich Kahler that it is not, that the inward turn of narrative is representation of an unstable conception of reality. And I think that the stronger rhetoric in that sense should be manifested in what might be called linguistic history that would concern not just the date of usage, but also the level of usage. And finally, um, I'm very struck by the uh, coincidence of names. I think that it was a wonderful send-off for Michael Fried's paper that the survivors of the Medusa were picked up by the Argus. And uh, I might remind uh, others who would be wisely unaware of this fact that the English boat that came to take the, the Duchesse d'Angoulême away from Bordeaux on was called the Wanderer. <laughs> The next name I have is indeed that of Professor Cameron. If he can disentangle himself from the...
One who isn't a, a student of comparative literature in the same profound sense as most of the people in the room um, is simply dazzled by the brilliance of successive speakers. And uh, what I want to do is to try and um, trace a source of anxiety that showed itself quite early in the, in the, uh, the, the first or the second session. Uh, an anxiety which was voiced by Professor Abrams, who unfortunately isn't here, um, and try and disentangle this so far as I can. Um, you, you may remember that Hobbes thought that um, metaphor was deceit and to be avoided in historical narratives except where you wish to open somebody's mind to some thing he'd missed. And Dr. Johnson thought of metaphor as a kind of embellishment which you, with which you surrounded the indubitable gritty fact to make it more pleasing or more palatable. Now I think that what Professor Abrams was worried about and I think others have been worried about is the, the notion that the distinction between the surrounding metaphorical structure and the central gritty fact is somehow dissolved away by the concerns of romantics and historicists and romantic historicists. Um, now, I think that there is a difficulty here which I'd like to illustrate in the following way. Um, everything we speak of, we speak of under a certain kind of description and the notion that there could be, as it were, an absolutely neutral and timeless language in which we talked about things is, I think, um, something that can't be defended. But there is, I think, a, a distinction uh, between a mythological description of, say, the thunder, uh, in which this is the anger of the god, and an aphorism which suddenly occurred to me while others were talking, uh, which Rosalind in As You Like It utters, men have died and worms have eaten them, but not for love. Now, the second sentence does seem to me clearly to be very much bound up with a particular view of the world. It's entangled with all kinds of considerations about man and mortality and love and all these other things. Nevertheless, I think we want to say, in this case, yes, yes, that's how it is. And I think we want to say this, yes, that's how it is outside the kind of religious or philosophical context in which Shakespeare was putting that into the mouth of Rosalind. Um, I think there is a kind of vulgarized Kantianism which we can slip into by which we think that if we speak of something under a certain description that in some sense the actual description is constitutive of how the thing is. I was very struck by that wonderful Pieta of Marat and I have the, the, his, his the dying of the dead Marat and I wonder now supposing some archaeologists had discovered this and had wrongly assigned it to the other party and had said this is clearly a, uh, a description of the, the dying Louis XVI. Um, now, it seems to me there are certain types of historicism which want to say that this would constitute this a description of the dying Louis XVI that simply by understanding it in that way, you would have somehow altered its nature. Now, it seems to me that forever that is a pieta of Marat. Whatever anybody may think at any time. And in this sense, I think I want to say there are uh, statements not expressed in some absolute and timeless language, but statements that are true or false. Um, Wittgenstein um, has done more, I suppose, than anyone else to stress the fact that we belong to a linguistic community and 
that all our agreements and disagreements must be related to the kind of linguistic community that we belong to, but he also s stressed the necessity for community of judgment. Without community of judgment, language doesn't, as it were, get going at all. There has to be some kind of purchase on reality for language to be. And all <coughs> types of skeptical arguments, or to speak in the Kantian mode, transcendental arguments, which either establish strange transcendental activities and objects, the, the imagination, as in Coleridge, um, these somehow have to be related for them to have any purchase on us to that which can be stated and to which we can attach certain terms of appraisal, well, not only true or false, but fitting, unfitting, wise, foolish, and the like. And I think I want to say that no matter what the historical scheme within which we make our particular judgments, there are certain elements in our judgments that transcend any particular historical formulation. Uh, I don't think that the usual refutations of E.G. Marx, this may please Professor White, uh, I don't think that when they say, well, after all, by your own theory, you yourself are a mere ideologist. This has always seemed to me to be an objection that Marx is very well aware of, and in one of the famous theses on Feuerbach about the, the failure of old-style materialism, uh, he showed not only uh, that he was aware of this, but that there was a possible way around it. Now, whether, in fact, his way around it is satisfactory is another question, I think. But um, I think with that, I will give way to the next speaker. Next name I have is Professor Louis Mink. If you can extricate yourself somehow. Uh, uh, actually, there's 15 minutes before, I think there are some other people who may have anything to say. Actually, what I want to say is only a comment in your sentence and a question, which is in a sentence with six semicolons in it, so may I say both from here. Um, the, uh, the comment is simply to note for the record that there hasn't, uh, nobody's mentioned North American Romanticism, much less North American Historicism. And on behalf of all the representatives of American studies, uh, and some who are, uh, um, uh, uh, I, I simply record the fact that while I'm not terribly displeased that uh, we didn't hear as much about Emerson as we did about Wordsworth, uh, <laughs> Emerson was there. <laughs> um, the, qu the, the question is this, and I, I pass up the chance to, um, uh, to continue Professor Cameron's remarks, except to say that I am in fact a vulgarized Kantian, and I recommend it to anyone who's uh, interested in the theory of history. Phyllis um, <laughs> uh, Miller um, convinced me that the form of the novel of the 19th century that presupposed or drew upon um, an implicit reference to historical representation. The form of the novel, to simplify it, comes from the form of narrative history, the telephone. Um, before that, I was convinced by others, in, including Hayden Wine, that the form of narrative history in the 19th century was a representation of the form of sensibility expressed in the novel. So my, my question at the moment is, did the form of sensibility uh, represented by novelists give rise to uh, the forms of narrative history, or did the forms of narrative history give, somehow affect the sensibility of novelists? Um, I don't think I would be satisfied with some kind of zeitgeist answer to this, that there was a sensibility representing itself in all of these different ways. Maybe the only possible answer to this is, tell, is merely to tell the story of how the succession of forms came about, which would seem, as a word of prejudice, the question in favor of a certain kind of answer. <laughs> Um, the last name on my long list is that of Professor Jeffrey Hartman, Yale.
I also feel that there are others who should be speaking, so I'd like just to add two minutes. Um, first, I feel somewhat playful. I guess I feel we've come to the satire part. <laughs> uh, but before I indulge, before I indulge I, in this, I do want to thank uh, the author of all this, namely Sai Hamlin, not only for begetting uh, the conference, but for being its preacher or evangelist and reminding us just in time that all is not vanity. Uh, in my own reflections on myself too, because the conference has taught me things, uh, I feel at the moment that I am going to go away thinking in a dichotomy, and I don't like to think in dichotomies. <laughs> it's not perhaps um, a dichotomy forceful enough um, to disturb me too long, it's too typological, uh, namely a division of the questions we've been dealing with into um, what is the mode of historical discourse. This is a question which might be answered in terms of a reflection on genre. I think Hanadi would like us to go that way. Uh, in terms of reflection of, well, I don't know what it is, of, of language, of topology, like Hayden White is suggestion, suggesting. And I want to say something about this type of reflection on the mode of historical discourse. And the second type of question I am going to be thinking about is not on the mode of historical discourse, and I, I understand that discourse is, is an ambiguous term, but on the status of historical discourse, which to me at this point has to do with value, that is with use and abuse. Now I don't make large claims for this dichotomy, it may prove to be totally false, but enables me to say something at this point, uh, a kind of summary uh, to myself. I've already mentioned that Hernadi felt very strongly <coughs> that we can't avoid uh, the genre question. I, I think this is true of Hayden White also. Uh, history is a tale told by whom? Isn't it a drama? Well, um, the, in a sense, you have to follow out a metaphor here, whether you like it or not. And however, the quality of your consciousness of the metaphor. If you say history is a tale told by whom, um, one, a one answer would be a tale told by an idiot, yet signifying. <laughs> <laughs> the other answer is a tale told by God, yet not signifying. <laughs> Uh, this is, of course, to uh, make a literary use of all this, but I am not sure we can entirely avoid that. That is, the, the very reflection on the mode of historical discourse, if it turns into a question of what genre, what language, um, is carried on often in metaphorical, metaphorical terms which have to break themselves and reconstitute themselves. And I think there were some others who felt that this was the case. And perhaps what Hillis Miller said about the raveling and unraveling, which we usually attribute only to <coughs> novels, and some of us don't even to novels, that kind of submerged self-consciousness, I, I think clearly this is, a, this is a very important contribution which White has made to uh, the examination of the mode of historical discourse, and perhaps is always there in philosophers, insofar as they look at anything except their own discipline. But then we know, <laughs> but then we know that uh, uh, the reason why Abrams's fear of being too self-conscious about this, uh, very sophisticated fear as he expressed it, doesn't come about, is because we always say to ourselves, like, physician cure thyself, you say philosopher cure thyself, but this simply means do more philosophy to get rid of philosophy, <laughs> historian cure thyself, Hayden White is not going to stop writing history, he is going to cure history by writing more history. So this would bring me to one last reflection on the mode of historical discourse uh, and bring me a little bit towards what I understood uh, Dieter Henrik to be, be saying, uh, that there is a temporal element which is indissociable, well, that's too strong, which is perhaps very closely tied to the hermeneutic element. He said that history was a sequence of interpretations, and I took it that he meant this 
on the on the deep structure uh, as well as on the on the surface. And when you think of um, history as a sequence of interpretation, well, you you can't have a sequence without it unfolding, as it were. I'm using a metaphor here again in time, and time just is necessary. Time is necessary in an obvious way for two things. If something seems to be simple or a priori, as Henrik has pointed out, it's temporal unfolding, even if it is you that is doing the temporal unfolding by your thoughts, rather than history itself conceived of as a part, a series of actions apart from you are doing, even if it is you who are doing it, you will find in that temporal unfolding contradictions. You problematize it by the very fact that you take the time to unfold it. I think this is just a, a fact of experience. Then there is the counter element to that, which is, of course, <coughs> that you try to solve a problem. Often you start, and there I think Henrik was thinking of religious hermeneutics especially, um, but it is there in, non, in secular hermeneutics too, you start with an antinomy or a contradiction, a contradiction in a sacred text. And the only way you can resolve it is by um, another kind of unfolding, which is in time and which is often narrative by coordinating two different parts of the text. This may seem like a spatial exercise, of course, but it is not purely that. Or by simply writing your own solution, which as such enters, of course, into a, a historical flow. So that I think there is a very simple but precise meaning in which um, uh, history, uh, whether you consider it as Geschichte, that is the events themselves, or history as the activity of your interpretation, is always at one and the same time a, a, a temporal and a hermeneutic matter. Let me go for a moment to uh, the status of historical deep discourse. Um, uh, when we talk about uh, history as a sequence of events, uh, we've already begun to question event and eventualistic history, and that, of course, is not my purpose here. When we go towards that, then there are some very, very, di very difficult and interesting questions which I think we haven't really raised, although in a certain devious way I, I try to raise them in my effort to save the ghost of Geistesgeschichte. That's what I was <laughs> more or less trying to do, and perhaps, of course, there's a danger of uh, disappearing, like, the, like ghosts do, do uh, at least to the scientific or to the scholarly mind, when one tries uh, uh, to, to, to save the ghosts of the past. Uh, let me go away, though, from, from my own effort and simply say this, that it's become perhaps more clear to us. Uh, I, we, were, we were getting marvelous slide lectures on the basically the Napoleonic divide, uh, with the post-revolutionary era and its agonies in, 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 in France, it's become clearer, and you can go to Wordsworth or to many others, uh, that uh, in a sense our, our notion or our consciousness of ideology, even though it then stretches back into the 17th century and so on, comes very strongly from that era, and you all know what, what Goethe is reputed to have, sorry, what Napoleon is reputed to have said to Goethe about political science is fate. Uh, uh, some say simply pol politics is fate. Well, uh, perhaps a better translation even is uh, propaganda <laughs> is fate, because that's what he, he, certainly one aspect of what Goethe, uh, what, what Napoleon meant, he certainly meant the science of politics, in, in the sense that you have to know how to govern and so on, but he also meant you have to make your power to govern absolutely clear <laughs> to everyone. In that sense, it involves ideology, it involves massive propaganda, and we saw in some of those pictures that the massive <coughs> propaganda uh, continued, of course, into the res Restoration, and I have a feeling that there's a certain um, massiveness that comes after the Napoleonic uh, era, which reacts against Napoleon, of course, but takes some of its own some of his own mass uh, massiveness uh, into itself. Um, let me finish by uh, talking about the status of historical discourse in that era. And it seems to me that uh, we need something like what Schiller called aesthetic education about the set that time, perhaps joined to some kind of historical education. It's the only Remedy is a crude word, but it is the only counter, in a sense, that one has to, to ideology, and that raises very strongly the question of the status of historical discourse and perhaps links it 
to the status of, of literature and literary discourse. Thank you very much. I'll throw the meeting open to remarks from the floor. When I recognize you, um, please identify yourself by name and institution, however eminent you are. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, Professor Miller. Martin Miller, University of Toronto. I've been thinking of two texts uh, that one might consider as the texts for which this, all this has been a commentary. One is Eliot's poem on the addressing of cats, and sometimes I've thought that we've been in search of the third name of the cat, the ineffable, effable one. But the other text is chapter nine of the Poetics, in which Aristotle brings together three things, history, poetry, which is in effect narrative, and philosophy, with his statement that poetry, narrative, is more philosophical than history because Poetry deals with things such as they might be, hoya and genoito, whereas um, history deals with what Alcibiades did. And Kurt von Fritz has uh, argued very persuasively uh, that this is very strange, that here Aristotle says that history deals with what Alcibiades did and not with what Alcibiades did and said. And he uh, says, this is an, a, a significant omission, and you must see it in the context of the practice of Greek historiographers, that they dealt very differently with the actions of men and with the speeches of men. And that in the genre of Greek historiographers, uh, that is in, in Thucydides, specifically in Thucydides, uh, what a speaker says may or may not be uh, documentable. It is also in some thing, uh, some way something that he might have said, and more often something that he might have said, something that he didn't really say. There is then in, 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 in Greek historiographers a, a clear distinction between the reporting of doing and the reporting of saying, and a distinction between saying and doing, which is of course a the, the great Greek distinction of Logos and Ergon. But um, this uh, doubles back on, on itself in a peculiar way because the act of writing history is in itself a saying. And uh, uh, one might, especially in the light of this conference, look back on any kind of history and say, well, its status as truth is in a peculiar way the kind of pe very peculiar status of the speeches of Alcibiades in uh, uh, Thucydides' history. Uh, and then there's a final reflection. Uh, there are facts out there, <coughs> gritty, nitty, important, or not so important. Um, but I often wonder um, about the Peloponnesian War, this uh, important event which Thucydides described and of which he said that it was the greatest war that had happened and it ended tragically with the fall of Athens in 404. And apparently 10 years later they were at it all over again. The armies were bigger, there were more ships and the ships were bigger and the money involved was bigger. Then you wonder, what really was the biggest event of the Peloponnesian War by, by any standard? And they say, perhaps the biggest event of the Peloponnesian War was Thucydides' account of it. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, if, <coughs> if Professor Hayden White were to raise his hand, I would recognize him. <coughs> no, <laughs> Professor White. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I've, I've, uh, I've learned a great deal from this uh, uh, symposium, largely the, one, the, most, the most important thing being that I have to write another book, uh, and that I'll start on it uh, with the notes that I've, uh, that I've collected here at this uh, symposium. But I would like to say, uh, to say that I note uh, two ambiguities that may be at the, at the center of Professor Cameron's paradox. 
And one that may help us uh, explain, I need a, a little chalk. Uh, uh, all right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Professor Cameron points out that we're, we're concerned with a historical problem, namely the relationship between Romanticism and historicism. Uh, and we're over here somewhere, and we look back on it, uh, utilizing a um, historical uh, consciousness or a way of looking at history in order to bring it into question uh, or uh, the, the very activity of writing history, uh, narrating history, and so on, uh, which was founded uh, or took shape in the form that we're using it at this time, so there's some kind of circle here. Uh, I think that the ambiguities also extend to two words, uh, to narrate, or narration and history, uh, the first being a Latin root word, which uh, in the Sanskrit uh, root uh, it means to know. Uh, 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 this root, and uh, the uh, but which we use in a dual sense, right? That is to say, uh, the act of narrating and the thing that results from the act of narrating, namely the text. Uh, so we have uh, the text here, sorry, and uh, this uh, <laughs> writing uh, or speaking here. Now, uh, the interesting thing about the word history is that it means to inquire. And we talk about uh, <clears throat> inquiring into the events uh, and the account of the events, the inquiry into the events, uh, what happened. Uh, and the, uh, the account of the events. Now here I'm getting to the, the point that you made, I, I, I think. Namely, that, that is to say, the thing produced by the inquiry uh, and the inquiry itself. Now, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, what I want to say is that uh, we inherit a problem, the problematics of uh, historical knowledge uh, and uh, it's all wrapped up uh, when, when we talk about narration uh, in these two senses. We're talking about the form of the narrative that purports to represent uh, the events themselves. Uh, I suggest that we have something like this. We imagine a chronicle of these events. And then we can imagine different ways of putting these events together in a, narr a verbal icon of them that purports to tell not merely what happened, but what was it. That is to say, uh, when Tocqueville says the real problem is not to relate what happened during the French Revolution, it's to find out whether a revolution really occurred or not. Uh, he put uh, the, dis the, the discussion of the revolution on a completely different historical basis. So supposing we say that there are various ways of plotting it, by which you give B prominence, and you get E, F, G. Uh, you give A prominence, and you get a kind of a deterministic history, uh, some primal crime or a primal scene, uh, E, F. Uh, you stress maybe B, or if you're teleologically uh, inclined, you, you say F. Now, uh, <laughs> and so on. Now, uh, these are the, uh, represent alternative interpretations of the same, of what appear to be the same set of events, but under different modalities of, uh, of organization of consciousness, and resulting in different narrative accounts with uh, with their own. Uh, uh, with their own uh, formulae, their own syntax, their own grammar, lexicon, and so on. I think that the situation that we're in now is that we want to say something like this the same way that Kafka would want to do uh, when he frustrates our expectations, or Joyce in Finnegan's Way. We say, what is history? Ah, it's this. You see, you're back to chronicle in some sense, but now you're denying that there's any, any kind of a plot uh, to be found uh, in, the, uh, in the events themselves. And this represents the crisis of historicism, in some sense, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, that was really, uh, I wrote that book out of an attempt to try to find out how we got into this uh, condition, uh, and with a view to asking how we might get out of it. Uh, I don't think we can do it by going back uh, to an early 19th century, or any 19th century form, of uh, historical representation or consciousness any more than we'd want the novel to recapitulate uh, Jane Austen uh, or uh, Scott uh, or, uh, for that matter, Thomas Mann. <laughs> Do I see... Uh, I think since it's well after four and since there seems to be no forest of hands, we might end with a vote of thanks to Professor Cyrus Hamlin for his organization and to all of us for being here. Thank you.